previously on the Lobby USA, spying on American students, a worker at the Israeli embassy describes her remit to our undercover reporter. It's part of a covert campaign to influence America's youth. We have three different sub-campaigns, data gathering, working on activist organization, money trail. Wow, it just looks like the state of Israel is employing little spies. In the second of a four-part series, how the pro-Israel lobby influences Congress. And as our undercover reporter gains greater trust, he is offered an extraordinary assignment. Using an undercover reporter, Al Jazeera's investigative unit infiltrates one of the most powerful lobbies in the world. Getting $38 billion in security aid to Israel matters, which is what APAC is doing. We examine how the lobby, led by APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, has secured unwavering support in Congress. Congressmen don't do anything unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. What the lobby is all about is to make sure that Israel gets special treatment from the United States forever. But after occupying Palestinian lands for half a century, the pro-Israel lobby is facing a new challenge. We called for a full boycott of Israel, divesting from it, and eventually imposing sanctions on it to achieve UN stipulated rights of the Palestinian people. A movement to boycott, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel, BDS, was formed on American campuses. It seems to be achieving its goals. It threatens future American support for Israel. We believe in justice for all people. So that means the occupation has to end. Israel's Ministry of Strategic Affairs responded with a covert operation to defeat BDS. The Israeli government leverages Jewish organizations yes. in the diaspora. Absolutely. It's a psychological campaign involving spying and smears. You discredit the messenger as a way of discrediting the message. Just stay on message. And what is that message? BDS is a hate movement. While our reporter monitored pro-Israel groups, he was asked to go undercover for the lobby. You're going into enemy territory, not for everybody. In Washington, Tony often socialized with younger members of the pro-Israel lobby. Here, the discussions are focused on influencing elites. Recent graduates appear to no longer care about debates they had at university. We try and go through student government and pass bills. I mean, you know, looking back on it now, it's all full It's total crap. So, yes, in general, obviously. But also, it's just, I don't know, it doesn't do anything. I mean, fighting back against it has no practical effect. What has a practical effect is getting Congress to give Israel military aid. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what happens at the University of X. What matters is what happens here, what matters is what happens in the capitals of the state, the capitals of other countries. The pro-Israel lobby is keen to co-opt elites beyond America. At a party organized by APAC, Tony met an intern at a public relations firm whose clients include the United Arab Emirates. The lobby apparently has allies in the Arab world. The American Jewish Committee is running a study tour to, it's either Dubai or Abu Dhabi, and they're talking about mutual cooperation. the ties like between the UAE and Israel? They're getting so much better. Nobody knows. The governments have to coordinate on security. It's all under the table. They're on trade, security, tech, medicine. There's a lot of cooperation. Basically, where I see 
state standing right now is the GCC has all this under the table cooperation with Israel, and it's getting to the point where it's getting to the surface. Does the UAE have a stake in BDS? They do run all the time the argument of Palestinian suffering and occupation. They do somewhat kind of toe that line, but that's because they have to, to save face in the Arab League. They're literally just trying to cover their bases. Are they actually helping out BDS in any way? They benefit from Israeli tech. So yeah. they're not gonna bet, they're not gonna boycott that. Why would they? Tony's boss at the Israel Project used to work at APAC, where debate about Israel's actions or Palestinian rights were rarely prominent. Does the war of ideas matter? I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that like getting $38 billion in security aid to Israel matters, which is what APAC just did, which is what I'm proud of being, have been a part of for so long. My job was basically to convince students that participating in the war of ideas on campus is actually a distraction. You can hold up signs and have rallies on campus, but the Congress gets $3.1 billion a year for Israel. Everything APAC does is focused on enforcing Congress. Congress is where you have leverage, so you, you can't influence the President of the United States directly, but the Congress can. APAC is very interested in making sure that every representative and every senator toes the line on Israel and uh, it is highly effective in that regard. That's why it's considered to be synonymous in many people's heads with the lobby. APAC's website shows members of Congress attending its conferences and declaring their support for Israel. And on behalf of Congress, thank you for sending a clear and unequivocal message to the world that the United States stands with Israel now, tomorrow, and always. I reject the BGS movement, whether it be on campuses in France and London or right here in the United States of America. To get elected in the American political system, you need lots of money. What APAC does is it makes sure that money is funneled your way if you're seen as pro-Israel, and it'll go to significant lengths to make sure that you stay in office if you continue to be uh, staunchly pro-Israel. May God bless Israel. May God bless the United States of America. May God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. They have questionnaires. Anybody running for Congress is expected to fill out a questionnaire. And they evaluate the depth of your commitment to Israel on the basis of that questionnaire. And then you have an interview with local people. If you get APAC support, then more often than not, you're going to win. Jim Moran is a Democrat who represented a congressional district in Northern Virginia. You realize it's not just the money, it's the number of concerned activists. They'll send out postcards, they'll make phone calls, they'll organize. And, I mean, that's the democratic process. They understand the democratic process. We made sure that there were people in every single congressional district. And then you'd call them up and say, I'm calling from APAC in Washington. I did these calls. We hear that you're good friends with Congressman so-and-so. Oh my God, yes. We've been friends since elementary school. Well, what does he think about Israel? I never talked to him about Israel. Well, can I come down and talk to you and help you figure out a way to talk to him about Israel? No, just tell me. What should I say? I don't have to, I'll just tell him. Our undercover reporter wanted to learn more about how funding is secured for congressmen. Speaking of the devil. David Oakes, a prominent pro-Israel advocate, invited Tony to a fundraising event. Oakes later called him to discuss the details. Is it just a social event? No, hold on. I'm going to email you a list of the people that this group supports. This is the biggest ad political group. Richard Byrd of Carolina, 
Kelly Ayotte, is fantastic. She's in the arms committee. They'll walk in the room and they'll say everything here is off the record. And then they'll say, here's a little bit about me, and then people will ask very specific questions. The fundraiser was being held in a wealthy suburb of Washington. A big tech room. It makes a difference. It really, really does. It's the best bang for your buck, and the networking is phenomenal. Congressmen and senators don't do anything unless you pressure them. They kick the can down the road unless you pressure them. And the only way to do that is with money. Right now, our current contribution limit from any person to a candidate is $2,700. Now, that's a lot of money, you know, and, and that can certainly buy us some gratitude with the lawmaker. But if you really want to add punch to uh, that type of buying of favors, what you do is you get 50 or 100 people together at an event like this, all chipping in $2,700, and then you bundle it all together and hand over the total amount to the lawmaker. At that point, we're talking anywhere up to a quarter million dollars. So suddenly you've got a group of people with the same demand they want from the lawmaker handing over a quarter million dollars. That buys a lawmaker. The fundraiser was for Anthony Brown, who ran for Congress in November 2016. This is direct spending. Brown's going to use that 30 grand to do ad campaigns. So they strategically pick the ones who are in the close reach that they want to build relationships with. Uh huh. So we want the Jewish community to go face to face in a small environment, 50, 30, 40 people, and say, This is what's important to us. We wanted to make sure if we give you money that you're going to enforce the Iran deal. That way, when they need something from him or her, like the Iran deal, they can quickly mobilize and say, look, we'll give you 30 grand. They actually impact it. He's actually saying, we're buying this, these office holders. And that's the point. We're chipping in all this money so we can hand over 100,000 or 200,000 to the office holders so we can buy them. They're not supposed to advertise. There's yeah. only the advertising laws. I was surprised they had an invite. I've never seen an actual invite before. Oakes described a similar event he attended in New York, which included donors from Wall Street. In New York, which is Talbot, we don't ask a goddamn thing about the Palestinians. You know why? Because it's a tiny issue, that's why. It's a small, insignificant issue. The big issue is Iran. We want everything focused on Iran. What happens is Jeff meets with the congressman in the back room, tells them exactly what his goals are. And by the way, Jeff Calvin is worth $250 million. Basically, they hand him an envelope with 20 credit cards and say, you can swipe each of these credit cards for $1,000 each. There is a disclosure law that is designed to highlight whether there may be potential money laundering going on in events like this. And that is if the funds are earmarked. Uh, and that means the organization has to disclose who showed up at that event and how much each individual chipped in and what they handed over to the lawmaker. What's the name of the group that puts this on? It doesn't have a name. There's no name. It's an ad hoc political group. For all the like, legal reasons, people pool their money. What this specific group is doing to try to avoid that disclosure requirement, it isn't taking money and then putting it in its own account and then handing it over to the office holder. It's just collecting credit card information and then turning that over directly to the candidate. Therefore, it's not violating the earmarking law and they're not reporting this. All we would see on the campaign finance reports are the individuals who contributed. But there'd be no record on those campaign finance reports that they worked together as a bundling group, that they were all at this event. All we'd know is person A gave 2,700, person B gave 2,700, and we'd have no idea they're working in, in tandem with each other. The one in New York is 10 grand over two cycles. It's a minimum commitment. Some people give a lot more than that. Whatever your commitment is, so like if you give five thousand, Jeff will ensure that we don't that I don't go over the twenty six hundred. 
If one is at a meeting where person A wants to give 5,000, another person has only $100 to give, and that person gave 2,500 to the other person at that meeting as a gift, and they both therefore gave a total of 5,000, 5,100, would that be illegal? That would be illegal. That would be laundering of campaign contributions. The limit applies to the individual. And so each individual is subject to that $2,700 limit. And if any individual goes over that limit, they are violating the contribution limit. They cannot legally do that by laundering money through other individuals. If you give $5,000, you can definitely ensure that we don't during a cab journey across Washington, Tony's boss at the Israel Project, Eric, spoke about his former job as a fundraiser for Jeb Bush. I was one of the first uh, employees of the Bush campaign. The first time Trump came up in a conversation was we were going to solicit him for Jeb. And we we're like, why isn't he writing a check? We would joke, like, this is the donor who went nuts. Eric shares his concerns about Jeb Bush's campaign. I hope the Justice Department doesn't make an example out of Bush, because we were operating in a real gray zone. And we raised enough money, we figured, you know, cut, let them come at us, we'll defend ourselves. We thought he's going to be the Republican nominee, everyone did at that stage. A relatively small number of families supply hundreds of millions of dollars annually to lobby politicians. The 200 families whose giving constitutes 90% of all political giving are not giving because they want a government contract or because it's good for their business. They're doing it because they actually care. In my view, it's obscene how much money there is. One of the most effective uses of the lobby's funds occurs when Congress is on its break. Every year, they fly hundreds of members of Congress to Israel uh, for these extended travel junkets that are, that are really lavish. They're first-rate vacations. They'll rack up $20,000 or more for a vacation for a member of Congress. The member can bring along their spouse, and they have a great time. You are told that Israel continues to be under siege from hundreds of millions of its neighbors who are Muslim and who hate Israel, who hate Jewish people. You're told that Israel survives because of the United States and because of American politicians like you uh, who support us. An attempt was made to change the law so that all expenses paid trips would be considered a bribe. I drafted legislation to try to reform the whole profession of lobbying to get rid of free travel and gifts from lobbyists the Honest Leadership and Open Government Act of 2007 significantly enhance the travel restrictions that if you're an organization that employs a lobbyist, you can only provide a one-day trip for a member of Congress. Then APAC exerted its influence. There was a major loophole written into the travel restriction that was essentially engineered by APAC, and this loophole is widely known as the APAC loophole. The clause excluded educational trips organized by a charity that didn't hire lobbyists. APAC happened to be affiliated to such a charity. It doesn't have an office, it doesn't have any employees, it's just a tax form that they filed. Gifts of dinner, gifts of wonderful resorts to stay at, gifts of entertainment, all of which is packed up into one of these trips is a very, very effective tool at influence peddling. Most of our donors were like the next, you know, yeah. the lepers. And there's, the quality is starting to improve. We're attracting more impressive people. Until recently, you know, the people we're attracting, you know, is the guy who's wealthy, gives away 25,000 a year, 10,000 is to us, and this is his hobby and full-time job, and he won't shut the up or stop calling. We're finally starting to expand into the class of donors that APAC has, which is like the more elite, easier to work with, smart, strategic, you know, writing big checks kind of like. It takes just as much time to get a $10,000 check from someone as it does getting $500,000. The money raised by APAC doesn't just fund congressmen who support their goals. 
if you wander off the reservation and you become critical of Israel, you not only will not get money, APAC will go to great lengths to find somebody to run against you and uh, support that person very generously. And the end result is you're likely to lose your seat in Congress. They threaten. They immediately threaten. Even if they know that APAC can't defeat them, APAC can make their lives more difficult. They can make sure that their next town meeting or something, uh, some members of the Jewish congregation jump up and say, but you're anti-Israel. In 2002, APAC was lobbying Moran to vote for the invasion of Iraq. The executive director of uh, APAC said that his most important accomplishment was securing the authorization for the use of US military force in Iraq. APAC was pushing it very hard. Why does APAC benefit from the United States going to war? The United States getting involved in wars in the Middle East is ultimately in Israel's interest, because we have a stake in the region. Congressman Moran refused to vote for the invasion, as APAC requested. There are compelling fundamental reasons why this body should oppose this resolution. Then at a public meeting, he was asked a question. A Jewish woman actually stood up in a town hall. And she said, uh, why aren't more Jews involved in the marches against the war? I said, if the leaders of the Jewish community were opposed to the war, I think that would make a difference. The lobby reacted, claiming this was evidence of Moran's belief in a Jewish conspiracy that was leading America to war. There was a conservative rabbi in my district who was assigned to me, I assume, by APEC. And he had warned me that if I voiced my views about the Israeli lobby, that my career would be over and implied that it would be done through the Post. And sure enough, the, the Washington Post editorialized brutally. Everybody ganged up. So what are the main outlets that TIP work with? Washington Post is the biggest one. Okay. Isn't that like just down there or something? Yeah, it's actually that building. Moran claims the Washington Post's editorial board has a close relationship with APAC. The principal editorial board of the Post itself has been a very effective instrument because they've been able to maintain their credibility. And, and it's a great paper in every other way but because they have such credibility, they're extremely effective. Everyone knew it wasn't anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism has come to mean anti-Israel. The APAC crowd doesn't really care very much about whether or not a person likes Jews or wants one to move next door. All they care about is what their position is on Israel. Both of my daughters married Jewish men. My grandchildren are Jewish. Anybody that considers me anti-Semite is ignorant. In part two, a battle over the definition of anti-Semitism on America's campuses. There are those who claim, oh yeah, we're trying to stop anti-Semitism, but what they're actually trying to do is stop advocacy for Palestinian human rights. In part one, our undercover reporter discovered that many young people in the pro-Israel lobby have given up debating the BDS movement on campus. Try and go through student government and pass bills. I mean, you know, looking back on it now, it's all crap. Fighting back against it has no practical effect. What has a practical effect is getting Congress to give Israel a military. Tony was attending a party run by an advocacy group that he joined. A journalist then approached him with an extraordinary proposition. He wanted Tony to work undercover for the lobby at a meeting of BDS activists. 
for the Algaminer, and we're trying to recruit someone to go undercover just to go there and just and just and just see what's going on. Okay. And I think I think the person would get paid for it too. A few days later, a journalist from the Algaminer contacted Tony. It was the undercover has to be kept pretty quiet. We would like to have some recording device on your person. Any level of potential danger or you know difficulty, violence or verbal assault, none of that concerns you or puts you off. No, because I think I'm pretty good at just being kind of zen in the face of um, verbal assaults. The Algemeiner claims to be the fastest growing Jewish newspaper in America. It pays particular attention to events on college campuses. We're working on a project now about ranking US universities and colleges in terms of their anti-Semitic and anti-Israel activity. We have a campus bureau that monitors this sort of behavior and these incidents and these campaigns all day long, all week long. The Algemeine often reports that anti-Semitism exists amongst pro-Palestinian student groups. The language that comes from those arenas move into that sphere of the new anti-Semitism, which is anti-Israelism. And that's a big focus at the Campus Bureau, looking at the blurring of those lines and where those boundaries have eroded. As journalists, right, exposure is, is the goal, exposing truth. In August 2016, a story in the Algemeiner caused waves in Washington's pro-Israel circles. The thing that I'm working on, you might have seen in the news recently about a school and anti semitism at the University of Tennessee. So the expose was on these anti-Semitic tweets. They uncovered 14 current students, five recent graduates at the University of Tennessee that have tweeted all of these horribly anti-Semitic things. The evidence was released by an anonymous group within the pro-Israel lobby. They're called Canary Missions. Nobody really knows who they are. No. Um, they expose anti-Semitism, anti-Israelism, and anti-Americanism in the U.S., like all the college campuses. They like study it and then release these like expose reports, but they're they're secret. It's like they don't reveal who they are. The University of Tennessee is based in Knoxville, a quiet city in the east of the state. Tennessee is conservative and religious. The Christian church has political influence here. Six out of 10 voters opted for Donald Trump. At the university, students and professors, including opponents of BDS, were taken aback by the headlines. It said that there was rampant anti-Semitism at the University of Tennessee. This was quite a shock. It was very surreal and strange. I didn't see anything happening on the ground. It, it all seemed to be um, internet-based. There's this international headline with our names and this defamation of our characters. It was the last thing that we were expecting to happen. I was surprised that they were targeting the University of Tennessee. I mean, there's just not a whole lot going on in Knoxville. It just seems such a benign target. Several tweets were clear-cut examples of anti-Semitism. Some failed to distinguish between Jewish people and the state of Israel. Others made vile references to the horrors of the Holocaust. There were definitely some very anti-Semitic things said, but it seemed to be by a limited number of students. Those tweets are horrible, and that should not be supported by anybody. 
one of the students, there were tweets from when they were 14, 15, and 16 years old. People do and say stupid things. Students who are campaigning for Palestinian equal rights were immediately suspicious, believing the Algemeiner had another motive in running the headline. The way that I saw that article was that to discredit some of the work that we were doing, they threw in these people who are a part of the Muslim community or a part of the Arab community around Knoxville and things that they had said, things that they had done. They were very old a lot of times before people had gotten to college. I think this is just old stuff that's being dug up for lack of any other material. I was really horrified that you had essentially this, this, this blacklist of um, students. The list included Summer Awad, a Palestinian American. She was accused of supporting terrorism after sharing a Facebook post. In that image, I mean, all it is is showing different tools of Palestinian resistance. One of them's BDS, one of them's stones, and the one that they circled happens to be the knife. They obviously have much bigger weapons than, than the Palestinians can even imagine having, but they're just able to frame this image of violence and to frame this image of defending themselves. Shortly after being named by Canary Mission, posters and flyers linked BDS supporters to Hamas. There was a list of most of the names of the students that were mentioned in the Canary Mission. All I kept seeing were flyers all over the place. Like, they'll put it on cars, they'll put it on side tables in the student centers and stuff like that. That kind of scared me to think that there are actually people physically on campus posting these things. Back in Washington, Aviva is drafting a letter to the University of Tennessee on behalf of the Brandeis Center. They want the university to take a stand. We're telling them that basically they need to issue a stronger statement. They need to investigate the students that were involved. They need to offer education and training. In addition to drawing attention to those responsible for anti-Semitic tweets, their orchestrated release served another purpose. It's part of a wider campaign by the pro-Israel lobby. The problem right now, I think, on universities is that administrations don't realize that anti-Israel statements or anti-Zionist statements often are also anti-Semitic. To find out what anti-Semitism means for the lobby, Tony visits Aviva's boss at the Brandeis Center for Human Rights in Washington. Despite its name, it's a pro-Israel lobby group. Hi. Hi. It's great to finally meet you. Really good to meet you. Kenneth Marcus is involved in the lobby's attempt to redefine anti-Semitism in a way that could include criticism of the state of Israel. Right now, the challenge is, is that there are people who say, you know what, anti-Israel politics have nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Well, you've got to show that they're not the same, but they're not entirely different either. The goal is to have the federal government to establish a definition of anti-Semitism that is parallel to the State Department definition. The U.S. State Department defines anti-Semitism using a three-point test known as the three Ds. It includes statements that demonize Israel, those that apply double standards, or those that delegitimize the state. There have been attempts by some to try to define anti-Semitism in such a way that conflates actual anti-Semitism with completely legitimate criticism of Israel or Israeli government policies. They are overly broad and vague to the point where any kind of criticism of Israel or of Israeli government policies can be labeled as anti-Semitic. One of the major tactics that the lobby uses to defend Israel, and it's done this for a long period of time, but it's using it more and more these days, is to identify people who criticize Israel as an anti-Semite. The letter that Aviva was sending called for the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, to address a long-standing problem of anti-Semitism on campus. The Brandeis Center is urging American universities to adopt a definition of anti-Semitism that could include criticism of Israel. 
We are trying to get universities to adopt a uniform definition, whether it's the State Department's definition or a similar version of it, because then we think that the administrators will be able to understand anti-Semitism better and discipline students for hateful and discriminatory actions. The Brandeis Center also wanted the university to screen what they described as a path-breaking film called Unmasked Judeophobia. It was made by a member of staff at the university and featured Kenneth Marcus. It is now socially acceptable to say lots of different things that were not acceptable in the past. Anti-Israelism and anti-Semitism is one example. It tries to make the claim that Muslims have adopted Nazi-like anti-Semitism and are going to essentially lead the next Holocaust on the Jews. The film positions anti-Semitism at the heart of the BDS movement. It was not sponsored by the chancellor, but it was held at the law school and Ken Marcus did attend. It was screened on the day that commemorates victims of the Holocaust. The film was not appropriate for Holocaust Remembrance Day. As a scholar of the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, I would just say the film's conclusions didn't meet scholarly standards. Exactly why Washington's pro-Israel lobby is concerned by events in Tennessee is at first hard to understand. Until one considers the growth of evangelical Christianity in the southern states. Tennessee is a Bible Belt state, and the capital of Tennessee is known as the buckle of the Bible Belt. And that good old Southern Christian culture is very strong here, and a big part of that has now become this, this rhetoric of Christian Zionism. Satan hates Israel and the Jews <laughs> because Israel's restoration initiated the last days of Bible prophecy. Christian Zionists believe that for the end of times to come, for Christ to return, it's necessary for Israel to control all of what was historically considered to be Israeli territory. Based on prophecy, Jesus Christ could never have returned for the church to resurrect the dead in Christ until Jerusalem was first in the hands of Israel and the capital of Israel. Christian Zionists and Christian organizations that, that lobby on behalf of the Israeli government. A lot of them have a theology, uh, which I think is in many ways anti-Semitic. The Jews have to leave the West. It says in your Bible, God will bring them back to Israel from the West. It instrumentalizes Jews in such a way that their goal is that all Jews around the world will leave where they live and move to Israel because in their theology that is what will lead to the coming of the Messiah again and then all the Jews will convert or <laughs> will all be killed. Leaders of the Christian Zionist lobby threw their weight behind the Trump election campaign. I have been asked 101 times plus, why do you think Donald Trump won? And I have an immediate answer because he was the only one that was blessing Israel. The evangelicals flooded the voting booths this time like at no time in our history. And a lot of the laws that are being enacted in those states that are pro-Israel, anti-BDS, uh, are coming about in part because there is so much sympathy for Israel in that community, which has a lot of political power. Senate Joint Resolution 170. By about a resolution to condemn boycott, disinvestment, sanctions, movement, and increasing incidents of anti-Semitism. In 2015, Tennessee became the first state legislature to condemn BDS. It's the result of the lobby's attempt to use legal means to quell BDS on campus. In recent light of anti-Semitic things that have happened here in Tennessee on our college campuses, we are just expressing our support as an ally for the state of Israel. And with that, I renew my motion. 
made it seem as though there's this huge Palestinian liberation like movement happening in this state. That's the way that it was presented at the legislature was that we need to stop this before it, it, it takes over our state. There's uh, an intensive effort by Israel and pro-Israel groups to get governments, universities, legislative bodies to adopt a definition of anti-Semitism that includes criticism of Israel and its state ideology, Zionism. We're the space where a lot of these things are initially brought and tested. The rough drafts, like the beta version, comes here. And then you'll see that same bill go into another legislator the following year. According to their definition, if I say to you that I believe that instead of separate Israeli and Palestinian states, there should be a single state where Jews, Christians, Muslims, atheists, everyone has full equal rights the way they do under the Constitution of the United States. That would make me an anti-Semite because I'm denying Israel's right to be a Jewish state. How to define anti-Semitism? I would say hatred, discrimination, violence, uh, animus towards Jews for being Jewish, I would say is the broadest definition of anti-Semitism. They have created this perverse definition of anti-Semitism where calling for everyone in Palestine, Israel to have equal rights is somehow an attack on Jews. And they're trying to get this pushed into official definitions and this has been a key goal of people like Kenneth Marcus and the Brandeis Center, so that they can then go after people who are advocating for equality and bring them up on charges that they're actually anti-Semitic bigots. You have to show that they're racist hate groups uh, and that they are using intimidation to, uh, to get funded uh, and to consistently portray them that way. Six months after the Algemeine ran its report, an anti-Semitism awareness bill was brought before Tennessee's State Assembly. The bill incorporates the three D's definition, which can include criticism of Israel. Kenneth Marcus gave evidence. When I had read a newspaper article in a major national Jewish uh, newspaper indicating some issues, we independently verified several different issues going on with blogging, I think it was Facebook entries, Nazi-type references to Jews um, and, and the need to kill Jews. They may have dealt with that, but it seems to me it's an indication that the problem is here. In order to create enough sort of political momentum and hysteria to get these bills through, you need to show that anti-Semitism is rife on campuses. You see groups like the Brandeis Center jumping on headlines, which are very dramatic and very scary. Incidents like the one that they claimed happened at the University of Tennessee are certainly helpful in a political sense if you're trying to push legislation like that through. Have a right to exist. Aviva Vogelstein also traveled to Tennessee. If a student on a campus says, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, meaning that from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, there will be no state of Israel, that that would be considered anti-Semitic. Um, another example would be when students on campus chant things like intifada, intifada, we support the intifada. That's calling for, an intifada uh, is calling for violence against innocent Israeli civilians. Um, and that is an, an incitement to violence. And it's calling for demonization and delegitimization of Israel. Seven months earlier, when Aviva was writing the letter to the University of Tennessee, she was talking to a leader of the Jewish community in Knoxville. It seems that she told Aviva that the University of Tennessee doesn't have a long-standing problem of anti-Semitism. She's like, I've been on campus for 10 years, and there have been no, like, actual incidents of anti-Semitism. Like, his tweets are obviously disgusting and need to be addressed. It's very misleading that they're calling this successful of anti-Semitism. Jewish students at the University of Tennessee repeated this sentiment before the state legislature. When people say things like we're experiencing anti-Semitism, it, it hits us pretty hard. Um, when we were told that this was being said about our university and the climate on our university, we were really confused because we had never heard um, any about any form of anti-Semitism that was happening on our campus. So this was kind of, you know, the first thing to come to us. So if we're the students who are supposed to have been 
um, affected by this so-called climate, you would think we would kind of know about it before. There's no evidence that there's sort of an atmosphere of intimidation against Jewish students. Once you look behind the headlines at Tennessee, that's what everybody said. I think it's important to highlight that um, any allegations that this bill is based off of, those allegations are purely uh, external allegations, meaning they're coming from um, all over the country except for Tennessee. Everybody agreed on that. The only people who didn't agree were the people coming from outside the university, Kenneth Marcus and others, who have the agenda to present the University of Tennessee and other campuses as dangerous places for Jewish students. One of the consequences of the allegations of anti-Semitism has been to temper activism for Palestinian equal rights. You can look at this campus in the last eight months and see that there has been little to no activism on that forefront. I would say last year this time, we had a new sort of like adrenaline underneath us and then this kind of completely killed our fire and it was hard to gain that momentum once again. Remember that there is two steps in the lobby's game plan. The first is to put out a story that's very favorable to Israel. But the second step is to do everything possible to minimize the amount of debate there is about Israel and silence the other side as much as possible. After Aviva spoke to Jewish students in Tennessee, she also learned that their greatest concern is unrelated to pro-Palestinian activism. PDS is not a real movement on the campus. Students for Justice in Palestine, which has like a large following nationwide, has like very few active student members. We mostly only have problems with um, Christians trying to proselytize the Jewish students because in the South, is everyone is so like, it's like even though. I find it incredibly troubling that at a time when we see a rise in real broad daylight anti-Semitism in the United States, there are those who claim, oh yeah, we're trying to stop anti-Semitism, but what they're actually trying to do is stop advocacy for Palestinian human rights. A short time later, the Algemeiner contacted Tony once more to discuss his proposed mission, to work undercover at a BDS event. The editor explained what they wanted. One of the projects that we've been looking to do for quite a while is to try and uh, infiltrate some of these groups, get undercover and discover what they're about from the inside. You explain the war, it's a hostile environment and there's some risk involved. The goal would really be to uncover any evidence of not just uh, bias, but, you know, real bigotry, the correlation between the BDS movement and hatred of Jews. Tony is given a list of persons of interest. They're all on the Canary Mission website. Go to canarymission.org. Have you heard of Canary Mission? Mm, a little bit. Could you tell me about it? People who hate it, the people who are being targeted by it, call it a blacklist. You have names here that show up on this database. Students and professors, faculty, speakers, organizations that have ties to terrorism, outright ties to terrorism, or terrorists who have called for the destruction of the Jewish state. Despite running Canary Mission's Tennessee expose, the Algemeiner staff say Canary's identity is still a mystery. It's an anonymous site. Nobody has any idea who's actually running this thing, and people have tried and looked into it. If you're on board in terms of concept, then I guess the next thing we just need to figure out is the money. Can we wait for a follow-up email from you? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. I should get that to you within the next 24 okay. hours. Coming up in episode three of The Lobby, how anonymous websites smear pro-Palestinian activists on campus. It was really an attempt by people who didn't know us to think, maybe I can destroy this marriage at the very least. It's psychological warfare. Drives them crazy. They're terrified of Canary Mission. And we reveal for the first time the people behind Canary Mission. 